title because I wanted to em I wanted to emphasize that when we try to make electronic learning environments succeed, the answers, the environments that succeed for some people might not be the same as the environments that succeed for others. And I think Sue's story just told us about how war games succeed for boys in encouraging them to pursue computer science as a career. And they don't succeed for girls. And I said for girls and boys because I think the answers often are quite different for boys and girls. And I'm going to be talking about a research project that I've been involved in for, oh, it's a little bit less than two years, so it really is something quite new for me. And I feel a little embarrassed talking about it because I think there are probably many people in the room who've been working in the field of educational software much longer than I have and know much more about it. And I will tell you why I chose this is the thing I'd like to talk about. But I want to start, start by talking about what I think the role of computing research is in the use of computing technology for education. And I think that the role of computing research is the same in this field as it is in every other case where we're trying to apply computing technology for an application. It's essentially to develop the understanding of the basic tools, both hardware and software, for how you can exploit the potential of using computing technology in that particular application area. And so in this particular case, we're trying to figure out how we can use computing technology to help people learn better. Um, this is obviously an area that needs an interdisciplinary approach, and I, I guess the two disciplines that everybody thinks of immediately are education and computer science. In my particular case, I'm going to be talking about an area where the entertainment industry or the field of entertainment is also a really important discipline because they, that is really the field where they've developed the expertise in how to attract children's attention and keep it through the use of graphics and sound, interactivity, and so on. Now, whenever you get involved in an interdisciplinary field, there are lots of great opportunities and there are lots of great challenges. Now, I did have graying hair before I got into this, <laughs> but believe me, it's getting grayer by the minute. And the kinds of um, interactions that go on are really trying to combine the cultures of computer science with those of education, and, and that's hard enough. There are different languages and there are really genuinely different cultures, understandings, values, priorities, et cetera. But then when you mix the entertainment industry, I mean, I've worked with the computer industry for a long time. I worked in IBM research for uh, many years. And so I'm used to the computer industry. And let me tell you, the entertainment industry is just different. It is really wild. Um, <laughs> so, and then you just talk about combining um, the values and roles and priorities and so on just between universities and schools. That's hard. But then again, you get into the industry and that's another story. Now, unlike many of the other areas of computer science that look at applying computing technology to application areas, so like graphics or robotics, databases, educational technology has not been a high status core area of computer science. It's, I would say, has been severely undervalued. Uh, it hasn't gotten a lot of attention. Believe me, there's no prestige there. And, um, and it's hard to get resources to work in that field. I said until recently, and, and one of the reasons in, that I'm saying until recently is I think this is really going to change. And it's partly going to change because of you. Um, I think one of the reasons it's going to change is because women are really good at this. And uh, women are becoming more and more of a force in the field of computer science as a whole. And I think this is one area where we are going to make a big difference and have been making a difference. So why has educational technology as a field of computer science been undervalued? I keep on hearing yes. <laughs> yes, you can say yes all you like. This is good. Come join us. Um, well, the first thing is historically there has been a lack of a commercial market. And I won't go into the reasons for this, but it has to do with neither the software nor the hardware was in a, was in a good enough state for schools to be able to afford it or for people to be able to write software that was going to be really effective. Another one is that it's really hard to measure success in this. Um, I mean, I'm used to working in theoretical computer science, and you know pretty much whether you've solved a problem or not in theory. I don't, nobody seems to know when you solve the problem in terms of helping people learn something. And it's really hard to measure when you're successful, and that makes it hard to evaluate who's going, doing good work and who's not. And then the final one is, Women teach. And um, 
historically, our society has not valued the things that women do as much as the things that men tend to do. I think that's changing, and I think we're part of making that change. But let me tell you, this area is important, it's challenging, it really is hard, and it's really exciting. And it's also a lot more easy to give talks to the general public about. <laughs> I can, like, I'm so used to traveling on airplanes and being working on, you know, sort of mathematical papers and so on, and somebody sits next to me and they say, you're a student doing calculus, right? And I say, no. Uh, <laughs> now I sit there and I program these educational software on my computer and they say, oh, what are you doing there? And boy, the whole plane trip could go by just telling them about it and everybody's always excited and enthusiastic. So in this talk, and I'm going to apologize for the fact that I'm not going to give an overview of the field of educational software and how it's developed. Instead, I'm going to focus on a particular research project that I've been working on for about two years called eGEMS. It stands for Electronic Games in Education for Math and Science. In a single sentence, the goal of eGEMS is to use the attractiveness of electronic games to increase the interest and in learning of children, particularly in the intermediate grades, so that's grades four to eight in mathematics and science. The idea of using electronic games to, for educational purposes is not a new one. There was a whole raft of people in the early 1980s who suggested doing this. Tom Malone did his PhD thesis uh, research at Stanford trying to characterize, characterize what were the features of electronic games that were attractive to children could be used for educational purposes. Joyce Hackinson, who's currently the president of Berkeley Learning Technologies in Berkeley, um, proposed to put together teams of artists, teachers, programmers, game designers to create such uh, educational games. And Doug Super, who at that time was a, te a math teacher in the Vancouver area, actually built, I think it's 144 math games um, to support kindergarten through grade eight curriculum in math that were marketed by, and are still marketed by Scholastic Press. And the amazing thing is that these are, have like the lowest level of graphics and sound you can imagine, because they were written in 1981 for the Apple II computer. And they now, Scholastic never upgraded them, but they just ported them to new platforms. They still earn him in annual royalties more money than he earns from his salary. Now that wouldn't mean much in, in most of the US because teachers are badly paid, but in Canada, teachers are paid as much as university professors. So, I mean, it's a non-trivial amount of money. However, I think it really is true that eGEMS is, to my knowledge, the only major project that is trying to combine research and development in much the same type of cycle as Fran Allen talked about and Mary Shaw talked about, um, and really is bringing together, hopefully, all of the different elements and disciplines that need to work together to make it work. So why am I talking about eGEMS instead of talking about what I usually talk about, which is theoretical computer science? And I just put up some of the topics that I would normally give talks about. It's certainly not what I've known for. Well, there's lots of possible reasons. Um, one is, could be more fun, at least more fun for you. Um, actually, I love giving theory talks, so um, it might be more fun for me giving a theory talk, and, and you might even enjoy it. And given that Chaffee is pregnant and can't come, maybe I should have given the theory talk. Um, more important, well, I actually think that the theory of computer science is an incredibly important area. So in no way do I want to imply that that's not something that people should be working on. But I do believe that right at the moment, there, and for the foreseeable future, that being you know two years or something, um, there are going to be more job opportunities in the field of educational software. And it is definitely true that as a field of computer science, it needs more attention. Um, it's also the case that um, we were asked to emphasize what we think the core research areas of the future are going to be. I think this is one of them. And then there's the other thing that over the last couple of years, I've spent a huge amount of time on this project, and so it's a natural thing to talk about. So, um, somebody, and I can't remember who it was, was it Telly or was it Barbara, said, gee, I wish people would spend more time talking about their personal um, experiences and how they got here. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you about the road to eGEMS. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long and circuitous route. <laughs> now, I mean, how many people have already traced the path that gets through there? One of the... <laughs> 
One of the interesting things about the maze, I drew it on the plane coming out here, is that in fact there are, this is one of these things where there's more than one route that gets you to eat gems, which is the way life is. So um, I'm going to start by talking about uh, what I dreamed about doing 30 years ago when I was 12 years old. Actually, it's going to be 31 in another month. Um, <laughs> The things I really loved at that point were mathematics, art, and building things. And I was going to be an engineer and an artist, a professional artist, both. And I thought I'd be an architect as well, because that sort of mixed them together. <laughs> Sounded good to me. You know, I had great parents. They had four girls, so they really lacked a son. So I just was the default son. And so nobody ever told me I couldn't do anything. Uh, well, that kind of anything. <laughs> I want to tell you that the only person who has had a wilder life than me that I know of that is a computer scientist is Anita, which most of you, well, maybe Barbara, but all right, I'm going to shut up about this. When I, when I got to university, um, I was signed up for first year engineering, and three days before classes start, somebody told me that the math classes for the, and the honors math program, which were different from those in the engineering program, were much more challenging, much better. So I immediately switched to honors math. And uh, so that was it for engineering. Um, I continued to take fine arts courses. I mean, art is something I, I really was very serious about and am very serious about. Um, but I was told, I mean, it was certainly the belief then, and, and it remains the belief to a certain extent today, that if you're going to be a, a successful mathematician, you're going to do your best research in your early years. That's bullshit. Um, <laughs> and if I had time, I would tell you the story about this wonderful woman called Rachel Rue, who has just enrolled to do a second PhD in mathematics. She has her PhD in philosophy. She's never taken any university mathematics, and she's about to start a PhD in mathematics because she's just solved an outstanding problem in combinatorics. And it's clear she has this incredible talent in mathematics, and she's 35 years old. All right? So, but in any case, that was the belief at that point. And I thought, I'll become an artist. I'll keep on doing art, but I'll be a serious artist when I'm old, like over 40. <laughs> I'm over 40 now. I'm more serious about art. Um, when I finished my PhD in mathematics, the job market in mathematics was really awful. Um, I did get a tenure track job at a not so great university. I went there, I taught, and I hated it. And uh, I found out that there were great, the job market in computer science was fantastic. And I just said, that's it. I'm going to do a second PhD in computer science. Enough of this nonsense of being in a department I really don't like and living in a place I don't like. I'm going to go and I'm going to get a great job. So I went back to, um, to university, the University of Toronto, and I started cramming all the computer science I possibly could. And um, my art sort of got smaller. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of time for it. But of course, I still wanted to do research in mathematics. And sure enough, after a year, there were job offers. I mean, I just couldn't believe how my life changed. So there's a moral here. The world is changing very fast, and the needs of the world are changing very fast. And virtually every one of us is going to end up changing what we do. Mary Shaw talked about this, and I think many of the speakers, if they were to talk about this part of the life, would talk about the fact that their research interests and their jobs have changed several times, and they will continue to change. And sometimes it's very painful. It was really painful for me. I love mathematics. I mean, it was like my, I don't know, blood or something. And to have to say that I was going to go back and I was going to do something slightly different really hurt. And I didn't like doing it one little bit. And those who knew me at the University of Toronto the year I was studying computer science as a graduate student, they can tell you how cantankerous I was. Um, it was a wonderful thing for me. I was forced to do this. And I think that if you can, when these things happen to you, and perhaps when you finish your training, the jobs aren't out there that you expected, and you have to change yourself a bit and look for what society needs, and try to sort of take the bits that you love to do and blend that with what's really needed, that's a really great opportunity for growth. Reach out for it and embrace it. I didn't. I complained. <laughs> <laughs> but being dragged, kicking and screaming into it, I um, benefited. <laughs> well, uh, next in my life came. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see art got really small. <laughs> and you know, math, I mean, I was, um, my mother 
as you know, had four children. And uh, I watched what happened to her. She was a, an economist. And uh, because of having four children, and be just because of the way things were in those days, she was out of a research, out of her career for 12 years. And the field of research in economics changed very dramatically. And even though she had a career afterwards, she's a very gifted teacher and was given tenure and everything like that, she could never get back into research. And the one thing I was going to do was not stay out of research for any significant period of time. So I went back to work uh, when my first child was five weeks old and back to work again when my second child was six weeks old. And um, that was really important for me, but it didn't leave a lot of time for anything other than being a mother and um, working on my job. But my kids grew older, and uh, I'll push the side up. And uh, as they uh, started uh, going to school, I started to spend a lot more time in schools. I've always spent time in schools, except for sort of this period in my life when motherhood was, when the kids were, um, you know, two and five and one and three and so one and four and so on. I didn't spend a lot of time in schools. But once they started being in school, I started to spend more time in schools. And what I was really interested in was how do we make mathematics and science for children as exciting as it is for us as researchers? How do we communicate that joy, that exploration, that just like immersion in problems that captivates us? And um, the more I thought about it and the more I looked at what children do in their day-to-day -day life, the more I became convinced that the playing of video games was the closest thing I could think of to being like doing research in math and science. Because it's, it's problem solving, it's exploration, it's forming hypotheses about what these virtual worlds you're exploring are like, uh, it's testing them. It's true that you don't write down theorems and proofs and so on. But I thought that there was a huge opportunity to encourage children to spend more time thinking about concepts in math and science if we could somehow create electronic games which by playing would have them naturally being exploring these concepts. And so I came up with that idea, I guess it's about two and a half years ago, and I, I thought it was a wonderful idea. I told lots of people about it. I had no intention of doing it myself. I had, at that point, I was still busy building the Department of Computer Science at UBC. Um, and um, you know, I just, I just didn't think it was realistic to do this. And, Nobody seemed to want to do it. And after you know about six months of sort of running around telling people about this, I said, the hell with this. I'm just going to do it. And uh, well, here I am a couple of years later. The one thing I can tell you about this project is that uh, the first thing is I'm back to being an engineer. I, well, actually, I'm back to try and push this from the craft stage into the commercial stage and into the engineering <laughs> stage. But, but I mean, it was so much fun listening to Mary describe these things, because that, that is just what it is like. Um, so I've come right back to wanting to be an engineer, and, and, and it's a wonderful feeling. It's also the first thing I think I've really done in my life that combines so many different things that I love. It really is possible to think about mathematics and computer science and art and motherhood and education all at once. So let me tell you a little bit about this project. Well, I already told you what the goal was. We want to make mathematics and science more enjoyable and meaningful to students by both creating new games that incorporate math and science concepts, though we're co focusing right now primarily on math, um, partly because I think it's harder, and also because I think that math tends to be liked less by more people than science, uh, because it's more abstract. But the other thing I want to emphasize is that um, nobody who's working on this project believes that we could actually create games which by themselves would encourage children to learn math and science. What we believe is that those games could be one more mode or one piece of a learning environment where the learning environment includes all the other ways that you go about learning things. So, you know, books and hands-on manipulatives and group projects and discussion and pencil and paper activities and on and on and on. So we also want to make sure that whatever we create, we also create materials that allow you to integrate these things with other ways of learning math and science. Now, what are the advantages of this approach? Well, the first thing is that electronic games embody children's culture. And it's always a good idea if you're trying to encourage somebody to learn something, to do it in a context that is pleasurable and meaningful to them. The other, another great advantage is that if you look at the way math is taught, and I'll just ask you, how many people have children 
oh, in grades, kindergarten through grade four at this point, or, or, or under grade four, okay? And how many people in middle school, like grades four to grade eight? All right, and how many people, children in high school? Okay. Um, if you've had children that went through kindergarten through grade three, what's that? College, sorry. Those of you with children in college, yes, by all means. Sorry, yes. Well, if you've been through this, oh, graduate students, <laughs> professionals, <laughs> grandparents. If you had children go through kindergarten through grade three, you probably know that they do lots of fun things with manipulators, with pattern blocks, with beads, with straws, with all kinds of things that you can pick up and arrange and feel and explore mathematics that way. One of the problems when you get past those early grades is that the kinds of concepts you want to deal with don't work easily with pattern blocks and beads. It's hard to make concrete manipulatives that actually allow you to explore the concepts. But it's not so hard to build those types of explorations and manipulations into electronic environments. And then the last one is, I don't know if you've ever uh, noticed the similarity between somebody who's hooked on playing a video game this glazed look, can't hear anything, motionless except for fine motor motions. And somebody who's working on a math problem, right? Glazed look. They don't hear anything you say, and they've got these fine motor manipulations, right? So I think people spend a lot of, I think children spend a lot of time thinking about video games, both when they're playing and when they're not. And I'd like to have some, some piece of that thinking be focused on some math and science. But there are lots of things wrong with this approach, and, and I know you would come up with lots more if I give you a chance. One of them is so many of the games that are out there, like it must be at least 95%, are really violent. And then the next thing is, I mean, I'll bet every single person in this room has at some point give some presentation somewhere to encourage girls to continue in studying math and science, right? We all do it. It's what you do if you're a woman that's in a math and science type area. Well, the last thing I want to do is create one more way of encouraging children to learn math and science that better works better with boys than girls. I mean, that just seems really counterproductive. And yet, in general, electronic games that are out there are less attractive to girls than to boys. Could have something to do with the first point. And then mind-numbing. Personally, I don't believe that playing electronic games is a mind-numbing experience, but an awful lot of parents and teachers do. And so just the whole idea of using video games or electronic games for an educational purpose is something that, that really scares a lot of parents and teachers. And so that's an issue. But even if these weren't problems, I mean, this really, I think, sounds, you know, this whole idea is such a great idea. I can't imagine why anybody would argue with it, except that nobody really knows how to do it. I mean, you can talk about the fact that many children like to play electronic games. You can talk about the fact that you could put educational things into the electronic games. But actually making it work in a way that keeps the game still being fun and accomplishes your educational goals, that is very hard to do. So when something's hard to do, that's great. That's a challenge. That's an opportunity for research. So what are the kinds of research issues that are out there? Well, the first one is, what can people? And, and I guess one of the things I want to stress here is I'm talking, in the, and the main focus of my project is looking at children, but, and it's looking at electronic games. But in reality, we're looking much more generally. These issues apply to electronic learning environments that could be used for in college environments, for lifelong learning, for senior citizens, for job retraining, for all these kinds of things. These issues are out there. So what can people learn in electronic environments? Um, they're pretty good as flashcards. They're good for learning your multiplication tables. OK, well, good facts, skills things like that. But can you really learn concepts? Can you increase your understanding of concepts? I don't think we really know that. And even if we did know that, there are many issues about how you actually design software to accomplish these goals and then how you use it. So just making something fun and still educational is tough. Um, children and adults like to play games in different ways. Different people like to play different kinds of games. Different people like to learn in different ways. 
how do you create software that accomplishes combining those particular goals? And then how do you make sure that whatever they learn transfers to other contexts? Well, we're trying to answer these questions. We put together a team that includes researchers in computer science, education, mathematics, psychology, curriculum developers, teachers, children, parents, and perhaps most importantly, professional game designers. Because believe me, designing games is a very non-trivial thing. It involves art, storylines, characterization, sound, uh, programming, goes on and on, user interfaces, goes on and on. And in terms of who's actually involved, it's a number of universities in both Canada and the US, um, Curriculum Development Center, and the main um, uh, professional game design uh, partner is Electronic Arts, which is the largest publisher of electronic games in North America. So what have we actually done in the time we've been doing this? And I, <laughs> if you have ever chosen to work in an area, I didn't understand this when I chose this, and maybe I would have thought twice about it if I had, that the media is interested in. The amount of time you spend talking to reporters is just unbelievable. Uh, not to mention the number of people who decide that they really need you for some film they're doing on educational technology. Well, first thing we did was we did a literature search to find out what was known about children with electronic games. Given the number of electronic game systems that are out there in the homes of children today, there's, I, the last count was 80 million units in the US, 80 million. That's um, probably one per household, probably more than one per household. Uh, there's an incredibly small amount known. So the very first thing we did was actually just study children in an electronic environment. We also developed a number of small prototype games. And this is the cycle of you build something, you try it with children, you change it. You build it again. You try to analyze what's working, what's not working, and you do it over and over again. And then another part that's been very important to us is we've actually worked on a commercial product that is a math CD-ROM game that will be out in the fall. And this is one of these things where we're trying to combine basic research with very applied research with actually working with the team on product development. And I have to say, as a theoretician, I am so much better educated now about the complexities that go on in, in really doing practical software development and, and thinking about marketing issues and so on than I was before. I thoroughly recommend, at least once in your life, do this. <laughs> you will be wiser and grayer. So I'm just going to talk very briefly about, seeing I have two minutes left before we get to questions, about research results from our first study. I'll, I'll just say that if you're interested in hearing more about this, there is a workshop on Saturday at 3, and uh, a number of people will be talking about things in more detail. The first thing we did was we set up a study in a science museum where for two months we watched children play games on four platforms, a Mac, a PC, a Sega Genesis, and a Super Nintendo system. We'd pick a set of four games that ranged from educational to entertainment, keep them there for a week. We had eight hours a day, seven days a week, two or three people doing, taking field notes, doing interviews, audio taping, doing some videotaping, and counting how many children every 15 minutes were where, and particularly looking at gender issues. So what did we find out from this two months? We looked at over 10,000 children. So that's a lot of children. First of all, girls and boys are similar in some ways. They both really like electronic games. They both enjoyed using them collaboratively. And uniformly, they believed that they didn't learn anything while they were playing video games. But they probably, they thought they probably did learn something while they were playing computer games, even if it was the same game. <laughs> It won't surprise you in the least to find out that we found out that girls and boys are different. But I think the thing that was so shocking for me was how closely they conform to the stereotypes we have of girls and boys. I mean, well, I mean, none of us in this room conform to the stereotypes because we've already chosen a non-stereotypical profession. But, oh, well, let's see. So <laughs> girls like socially worthwhile things. Right? So they like computer games more than video games, because you're more likely to be doing something worthwhile on a computer. They like games with worthwhile, worthwhile goals. They really like creative design activities. They like familiar games more than new games. They like games with positive social interactions. No big surprises. They were much more timid in getting access to the games. Um, boys liked, well, video games more than computer games. They like entertainment. Boy, did they like to have fun. 
They like fast action adventure games. They like new games as much as familiar ones. They like violence, but violence wasn't as important to them as perhaps the popular media would have you believe. They enjoyed it, but they didn't necessarily think it was the only important thing in a game. That's good to know, yes. Um, I'll just very briefly tell you a little bit about the other kinds of things we've done. We took the issue of collaborative play, and um, this will be talked about quite a bit more on Saturday, and looked at 104 students in grades four to six playing an electronic game called The Incredible Machine that they've never played before, and tried to find out whether playing with a partner, either sharing a computer or having two separate computers, would cause you to get further in this game. This is a puzzle solving game. And the, what we found quite surprising out of this, that there was only one playing config configuration. We had equal numbers of boy-boy pairs, boy-girl pairs, and girl-girl pairs, and also solo playing. The only one that did worse than the others that was statistically significant was two girls on two separate computers. And the easy way to say it is that they goofed off. When they shared a computer or when they wasn't two girls with separate computers, they were focused on their task and they did just as well as anybody else. When they had two separate computers, they goofed around. Well, I don't have a chance to really spend time on telling you about the math games we've been doing. Um, I really believe that of the things that I've tried to do in my life, this is probably the one that's most important. It's also the one that I have the greatest fear of failure. And so I'd like to close by saying that one of the things I've tried to follow in my life is to try things that I know there's a chance I won't succeed at. Now, my fear of failure here is that it's a very hard problem, and we could work for five years and not really understand how to do this well. And yet, I think it's an important problem, and it's worth dedicating a huge chunk of my life for the next five years to really try and make progress. So, it hurts to fail. I've tried lots of other things in my life at which I have failed. And then I've tried some other things in my life at which things have worked out better. But I'd like to encourage people to be willing to sort of say, I'm going to take a mix of the things that I'm pretty sure I can succeed at and things that I'm pretty sure I won't succeed at, but which I think are really important, and to try and combine those together. Because that's the way that I think you really are the most likely to have the most impact on the world around you. And so this is my one for, um, I'm going to try. Um, it's hard. It's very frustrating. It's very exciting. And I think it's really important. Thanks. So I've been told I have two minutes for questions. Go for it. Do I need a microphone? What is this? One of the things my son said to me when he came home from school, probably about fourth or fifth grade, was that he had learned nothing new in that, he didn't expect to as long as he stayed in that school, which was through eighth grade. Um, from what he had heard, they were going to learn nothing new. Um, one of my concerns is that in math education, we need to be prepared for the kids who learn about negative numbers and multiplication and all the things they will learn at these ages fairly easily. And build things that will in fact allow them to go beyond that and not be bored by math and science by second or third grade. Have you had a chance to think about that at all? Um, yeah, my son feels exactly the same way. <laughs> so I've been through this. And uh, I think one of, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do is to create activities that are open-ended enough that there are opportunities for children to explore much more interesting things if they're already past learning about negative numbers and fractions and, and geometric shapes and so on. But it's a very good question. And I think one of the problems about our math curriculum is it cycles right now. And so if you learned about negative numbers in addition, multiplication, division, subtraction in grade three, there is nothing much else that you get exposed to before grade eight. So it's, it's a good point. Yes. The question is, I said that the project was very hard. What's the most difficult part? I think there's two most difficult parts. One is the fact that it is so interdisciplinary, and I spend a huge amount of my time trying to make sure that we keep on communicating and keep on expressing value for the other parts of the team, because it's so easy, because we use different languages and have different value systems, 
for various pieces to feel that they're not being treated as though what they contribute is, is valuable. So the interdisciplinary part, as a manager of an interdisciplinary team, is really difficult. The second part is figuring out how to really evaluate whether learning occurs. And then there's the part about the state of the schools and just the whole education system is a very difficult thing to affect as a whole. So there are lots of hard pieces to it. I guess the last one, yes. Have you, have you studied uh, the existing games that children do enjoy, like Carmen San Diego and uh, as well as the war games, uh, to see what characteristics that could port to man? So the answer is yes, that that's basically what we did over the summer is to try to look at games that were popular. Um, and we, in fact, did not try to avoid um, violent games in our study because, I mean, it's those are the ones the kids like. What if those are the ones the kids like? Isn't there something that we can find out that we can use to continue to um, make it fun for the kids and just extract the war aspect of it? So yes, exa we are, that's exactly what we are trying to do. So yes, we studied existing games and we looked at games like Carmen Sandiego, like Super Mario, like Sonic, like Spot, etc. When I say we didn't use violent games, we didn't have Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter II. Those were the ones that we decided to leave out. Though, in fact, we have looked a fair bit at what's going on in those games as well. So, and, and in fact, that's one of the reasons for working with the professional game designers so that we get their expertise. They have a very strong taxonomy of, of what works and what doesn't work. So that's one of the reasons for having them as part of the team. Thank you.